This is today's CME code. And again, we have the applicants today. Welcome to uh, Duke, sort of. I, I'll be speaking to you all in about a, an hour. Very happy to have you. Some news from the department. Suma is uh, leading a, a DREAM seminar, which is our MS program on MS and pregnancy at the Massey Conference Room at five. Oh, live update. Uh, it's actually tomorrow at five. Okay. And for those of you who don't have a headshot for the department website or your ID or anything, the school is hosting one uh, this Friday. Just email Will and uh, get yourself a beautiful glam shot for the website. Uh, our epilepsy division is hosting, I believe it's just an online uh, Life Without Limits Epilepsy Symposium Saturday, November 11th. All are invited to attend uh, virtually. And there's a screening of the documentary, Matter of Mind, My ALS, which will be held uh, November 13th. And you can also email uh, Rick or Will about that. Uh, Maggie, Marjorie Soltis, is this a week's, what does she, what does she learn from being a resident? And, and is, I think everyone would agree with this. It is the uh, fellowship and teamwork an incredibly uh, close quarters uh, that people work with when they're residents and getting to know people. That's what Maggie says. Uh, Ethan Iman, who's one of our current uh, residents, gets an all-star from Eric Conklin. I don't know who's Eric Conklin. Wow, good for well, already. I think that might be the first, but that might be the first uh, intern who's ever nominated an all-star. And good for him. As an intern, you did? Did you nominate someone when you? No, no, no. I was talking about Eric played basketball here. Okay. Well, I played hockey. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, but my, my team was not. All right. So uh, Eric just talks about how, how Ethan stayed late in a violation of uh, ACGME rules to do a lumbar puncture and make sure the day got off to a great start. Yeah, Ethan's a wonderful person. And in Newsweek, our own Greg Kogan uh, is developing a device that translates brain signals into speech. And uh, it's already been implanted in four patients undergoing brain surgery for other conditions. Isn't that a problem? When like you put one of these things when it's supposed to be another kind of surgery? That's like when they operate on the wrong eye or something which happens. But anyway, great, great work, Greg. And two weeks ago, we talked about all the NIH grants he's landed. So we're still looking for an APP lead. I think there's an email going out about that today. The annual holiday fleece is underway. Uh, everyone got their clinic metrics and effort distribution or should have. We're not saying that this is the truth. We want your help in figuring out what we're getting wrong. And the Christmas party is December 15th. Now, under the did you know, did everyone know the, the, uh, the Civil War actually ended in Durham? Everyone thinks it ended with Appomattox, but that was just, the Civil War was a battle of multiple armies. It wasn't just one US Army, like there was a Grant's Army, and there was also Sherman's Army. And after Appomattox, Sherman's Army was still fighting, as was Joseph Johnson's Southern Army. They surrendered 17 days later at Bennett Place in Durham, which officially ended the Civil War. And you can go visit Bennett Place, but I think it's just a tiny little shack. I, I don't, I haven't been there. I have to drive by it to drop my dog off. Uh, and I always see it there. But yeah, that's where the, the Civil War, uh, you know, the last battle of the Civil War ended. And, and they chose Durham. Here's the interesting thing, because the governor at the time, or the senator, whose name was Zebulon Vance, that's where the name of the city comes from, is the person who arranged this meeting between the two generals here in Durham. Durham was not a city at that point. It was still just a railroad stop. Uh, neurology photo of the week. I saw this picture. I didn't know quite what it was, but it turns out this was a Halloween uh, costume party by Roshni and Jordan Larson uh, trying to match Chris Eckstein's sartorial splendor. And it's a great picture. Suma was part of a trial looking at cryocompression on chemotherapy-induced neuropathy. She's going to have to tell me what cryocompression is. Uh, Wayne Feng, Sarah Asani, and Dylan Ryan looked at the use of propanolol for cavernous sinus malformations. Andrew uh, Spector was part of a sleep expert panel. 
uh, who said we shouldn't be changing times twice a year. We'll all give an applause for that. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? Pick one and stick to it. I mean, old people like me, we fall off ladders and step stools as we're reaching up for these clocks that are high up on your walls. It's a very dangerous time for us. Uh, and uh, congratulations to the Duke epilepsy team and the Anfi lab who raised $34,000 to fight epilepsy. And more importantly, there's Atif uh, engaging in a very vigorous cornhole tournament, which apparently the Duke team won. And guess, look what he's wearing. He's wearing a nice departmental fleece there. That was the height of fleeces. That is everyone's favorite fleece. Indoor, outdoor pockets, full zip. <laughs> We're going to try to reproduce that this year. All right, this is today's CME code. And today's case presentation is, is Christine Givis. All right, Christine. And that is how it's pronounced for all of those who think I, I blew it there. All right, how do I? All right, there you go. Stop share. All right. Let me see. So where did my where did it go? You on your desktop? You just gonna call it up? Okay. Well, I'm trying to find it. Where did it go? Is it on the desktop? No. Oh, I see. Oh, here it is. Uh, no, that's not it either. Oh where no. Did where did it go? My screen saver. Up there the oh yeah. gosh. Where? No, that's that's Will. Oh, it's Will. Oh, okay. Looks like you. I'm here. I got gray hair. Oh, there was you. I got gray hair. You mean like when I was young? Let's see. I got a screen share right. Yeah. So go to screen share. I'll show you the right. And you choose That's that one. one. Yeah. Okay. And then hide your floating meeting controls. There you are. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Christine. I'm one of the PGY4 residents doing a quick case presentation. So I have a patient who's 64 years old. He's coming in with subacute onset confusion, headaches, nausea, vomiting, and fevers. He has a medical history significant for interstitial lung disease uh, due to undifferentiated connective tissue disease. He had a lung transplant and is on multiple immunosuppressants. And Dr. O'Brien wanted me to put that we are the number one in lung transplants. Uh, in the nation. So in the world, in the world. Okay. Uh, he has a social history significant for former smoking and drinking, and he enjoys outdoor activities. So some of his symptoms, three weeks prior to presentation, he was dizzy, had these global body aches and headaches. Two weeks prior, pro progressive confusion began. And then a week prior, he was incontinent of his bowel and bladder. And then two days prior, he had a fever. His initial exam, he was febrile and tachycardic. He was ill-appearing. He woke up, but in between exams, he was somnolent, kind of mumbling incoherently, oriented to himself, but no other things. He wasn't able to provide any further history and could not follow any simple commands. The rest of his exam was pretty inhibited by his mental status, but was notable for a high frequency, low amplitude tremulousness and some hyperreflexia. His initial labs, he had a pancytopenia. Um, he was hyponatremic, had an AKI, newly elevated uh, liver enzymes, as well as a coagulopathy. And notably his blood cultures were negative, his respiratory panels were negative, and his cyclosporin level was normal. He did get a lumbar puncture because of his immunosuppressed status, uh, which had a mildly elevated protein and elevated nucleated cells with a neutrophilic predominance. His PCRs were negative, as well as his cryptoantigen and cultures. Got some imaging of his brain, got a CT head and an MRI, both which showed ventriculomegaly, which he had on prior scans, um, but nothing new and different. He had a normal C-spine and diffuse slowing on his EEG and a CT abdomen pelvis, however, was notable for splenomegaly. Uh, because of his immunocompromised status, he was kind of broadly treated, concerned for some infectious agents. So we got vancomycin, zosin, ampicillin, acyclovir, and doxycycline, and had a pretty broad infectious workup, all of which is on the right, and it was all negative. But on the fifth day of his hospital stay, he, his tick-borne PCR panel came back, and it was positive for Ehrlichia chafensis. And so we kind of discontinued the rest of his antibiotics, antivirals, and he was continued on doxycycline. So the, the total diagnosis was CNS and disseminated Ehrlichia. Um, as he got treatment, his clinical symptom improved and became more alert, was able to tell us that he was traveling in North Carolina and Florida, 
and again, does a lot of outdoor activities. He had recently had seen some ticks on his body. So a little bit about Ehrlichia. So it's transmitted by the lone star tick, which is there. It's named because of the spot on its back, the singular it spot. Like yeah, it's, it's fair. <laughs> um, but the bacteria itself is the rickettsial bacteria. It's an obligate intracellular organism. And there's kind of the, the distribution in the US of the lone star tick, both of which North Carolina and Florida fall into. Uh, Ehrlichia has an incubation period of around nine days. You get early symptoms of kind of generalized malaise and the later symptoms include the CNS symptoms as well as kind of this toxic shock-like syndrome with um, uh, multi-organ failure. So the risk factors for, for that more severe symptoms, a lot of our patient had. So the older age immunocompromised organ transplant and immunosuppressants. You can get a rash, it's more common in children, but uh, it's not always present and it's pretty nonspecific. Interestingly, you can also look out for this alpha-gal syndrome where um, being bitten by the lone star tick, you get an allergy to, to mammal meat and mammal-based products. So the testing options are two. The most important one is the serum PCR, which is uh, most sensitive within the first two weeks, uh, but it decreases in sensitivity as you empirically treat. So you wanna make sure that you get it. You can get a PCR in the CSF, but the sensitivity is unknown. Um, and then there also is acute and convalescent testing, but that's, it, it takes a really long time to come back. So less important in the acute period. You can see it on blood smear too, but only in 3% of cases, but that's what it's gonna look like. You're gulay see these intracellular organisms uh, that are called morulae within the monocytes. Just a quick review on CNS Ehrlichia, more related to us. So it's a present in about 20% of cases. Again, most often in any immunocompromised hosts, you're looking out for meningitis and encephalitis. You can have seizures, but they're relatively rare, two to 3%. And be careful with your testing because CSF is only positive in 50% of cases. Could be neutrophilic or lymphocytic pleocytosis and your imaging is most often normal. Treated with doxycycline for 10 to 14 days like our patient, and you wanna start this early. People who were started within the first 24 hours had a better um, clinical outcome in terms of mechanical ventilation and hospital stay length. So a couple of key points, if you have an altered mental status patient, uh, make sure you take social history, it's always important. Uh, if there's other signs like a rash, elevated transaminases, multi-organ failure, splenomegaly, pancytopenia, think about ticks, especially in the summer in certain locations. Your imaging and CSF findings can be normal, non-specific, so don't always trust them. And there's kind of an interesting question of should we do regional or seasonal based meningoencephalitis coverage with the addition of doxycycline, um, especially if the patient can't get a lumbar puncture. So should we add that on to our, our criteria? And that question was posed by one of our new attendings, Dr. Morena, who did a case series in this. So I used, I, I used his research for that. That's it, thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. So that was under five minutes and it was great. And there are two things I take home from that. First of all, a crypto antigen was done, which we discussed at this very same case conference, forget that PCR. And now there's this tick PCR I didn't know existed that I think we should start using, you know, judiciously, but in the appropriate case. So anyway, uh, thank you for that great case and, and, and enlightening us about that. Uh, okay, so today's grand round speaker is Sri Shah. Sri, uh, Sri is, is, is close to my heart because uh, first of all, he's, he's very funny and hardworking, a great doctor. And he was uh, the first kind of outside recruitment to the uh, neuro ICU in my time here. Uh, he had done his uh, ICU training at, at uh, the Mass General after his uh, residency at Baylor, and then did a stroke fellowship at the National Institute of Health. So he's double certified, as, as a lot of our docs are, in ICU and in uh, vascular neurology. And uh, as I said, I'm always happy to see him on the rounds. He always has the biggest smile. He, he currently is also one of the medical directors of the ICU and also the neurocritical care fellowship director. So uh, it's an honor to introduce Sri to today's talk. And let's see, what's Sri, what's your title? The art and science of neuroprognostication, probably more art than science yes. would be my guess. All right, Sri. Very true. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. O'Brien for the, that kind introduction. And I just wanted to uh, correct one thing. Uh, Dr. Christian Hernandez is the new Neurocritical Care Fellowship Director now, so. Oh, my bad. No.
Yeah, we have, there are too many things that are titled Duke Grand Rounds. Here. How do you know all this? That's our goal. Oh, yeah. How do you know all this? You have a very good spacious. You'd be good on those old, what was the Pokemon you have to remember where they were all hidden? Remember that one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to play that with my kids. And then hide your floating meeting controls. And you're off. OK, great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, today's topic uh, is something that is uh, very close to uh, my heart, mainly because uh, this is something that has flummoxed me number of time over the years. And every time I feel that I could have done a better job. And that's why like, I thought it might be a good opportunity for me to review the current literature on uh, the evidence base for prognosis after neurological injuries. Uh, it is not uncommon, especially in the inpatient setting uh, that you will be asked about uh, your input on how the patient is going to do after a brain injury, be it be a ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke or TBI, or most commonly an oxic brain injury after cardiac arrest. Uh, even in, in this situation, when you provide a prognosis that is poor, it does serve a very significant purpose because it basically allows the patient's family member to get a clo uh, closure of that uh, event. Uh, oftentimes it leads them to align goals of care for the patient, uh, which are more close to patient's uh, own wishes. Uh, the downside is uh, if you end up making a wrong prognosis judgment, then basically you're going to lead uh, to a false uh, prophecy of uh, withdrawal of care because your word will count as a physician or the provider uh, for the outcome in that case. Uh, most uh, recently this year, we had two excellent talks Around this uh, topic uh, earlier in the year, uh, we had a talk on uh, ICH outcome and prognosis uh, uh, earlier in the year. And then uh, Dr. Wayne Feng gave an excellent talk on how to predict uh, motor outcomes after ischemic stroke. So for the purpose of this talk, I wanted to focus on anoxic brain injury uh, that is seen after cardiac arrest. So I would start with a, cl a clinical weakness. This is uh, actually one of the current case that I think consult service may be saying. Uh, this is a 27 year old man, uh, most likely an opioid overdose leading to uh, respiratory failure and uh, uh, hypoxemic uh, uh, cardiac arrest. Patient uh, was resuscitated in the field and then brought over here, admitted in the C cardiac ICU where Temperature management was initiated with the gold temp of 36 degree, which is like the current standard of care at Duke. Uh, next morning, uh, you're part of the neurology consult team. You go see the patient. Uh, and the exam is basically patient does have a uh, pupillary reflex, but the corneal reflex is absent. Uh, you are observing some myoclonic movements uh, and the EEG is on and it is showing burst suppression pattern. So at this time, like what based on this information, what do you think will be the patient's prognosis? Be it be poor, undetermined, good, or uh, defer the prognosis at this time? Uh, any takers from the residents here? Feel free. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we should be deferring the prognosis at this time. Uh, so cardiac arrest is actually a huge a burden uh, because of the high morbidity and mortality associated with it. Every year, about 600,000 patients experience cardiac arrest out of hospital in US. Unfortunately, majority of these patients don't make it to the hospital. Only one fourth survive till the hospital admission. And out of this one fourth survivors, more than 80% are comatose within the first hour of return of spontaneous circulation. And if you look at within 72 hours, still 50% of patients are comatose after return of spontaneous circulation within 72 hours. 
But the caveat is this persistent coma uh, at 72 hours or even beyond that does not automatically imply a poor neurological prognosis, which is a very important thing to remember. The patients who are still comatose at 72 hours, 10 to 20% of patients would eventually wake up. And once these patients wake up, a large majority of them will actually have a good neurological outcome. So the fact that they came out from coma, although it was delayed, it still uh, indicates like they will eventually lead to like good functional outcome. Uh, and that is why prognostication uh, during patient care, especially in the inpatient setting, becomes very essential. It becomes inevitable and it routinely occurs. Uh, either we feel comfortable with it or not. Uh, and the most important thing we should remember is like, uh, be aware of the self-fulfilling prophecy when you are providing a poor prognosis. Uh, before we review like how we should base our guidance about prognosis, I, I just wanted to clarify some definitions. So what is considered to be awakened from the coma? And uh, looking at the literature, there are various definitions used for this. Uh, one common is a GCSF score of greater than eight. Uh, some studies have also used the RAS score of greater than negative two, which is commonly used in the ICU setting when we are determining the sedation level. Uh, ability to follow commands or orientation to person, place, or situation. All of these were considered in different studies as a marker of awakening from coma. Uh, and when looking at the long-term neurological outcome, which are usually assessed uh, at three months after return of spontaneous circulation. There are two most widely used scales, so it will be good to be familiar with them. The first one is called the cerebral performance categories, which ranges from one to five. And uh, this is similar, like somewhat similar to like modified ranking scale, where the lower scale is a better prognosis. So uh, CPC grade of one is like the base possible outcome with no or minor disabilities while the CPC grade five is a uh, patient is dead. Uh, when CPC scale uh, grade three to five is considered to be a poor outcome where patients are unable, unable to perform daily activities uh, ranging from that to that. The other common outcome scale used to assess uh, neurological outcomes at three months uh, in this patient population is called Glasgow outcome scale extended. Uh, which is basically uh, adopted from the traumatic brain injury literature. Uh, this scale ranges from one to eight and higher the score is portrays better the outcome. So Gauss score of one is when patient is dead while Gauss score of eight is the upper limit of good recovery. Uh, and in this scale, Gauss score of one to two is considered to be a poor outcome. These are some of the existing guidelines in place that are still used and widely cited. The most recent one being from the Neurocritical Care Society for prognostication in comatose survivors of cardiac arrest. Uh, so a lot of uh, data that I'm presenting is uh, based on the reviews of these uh, articles. Uh, one thing I would highlight is that the studies on this in this field are very uh, biased and limited uh, because uh, many variables that are available for predictions are not well validated across different population. So if you have a patient who is like really young survivor of cardiac arrest, uh, you should not blindly apply all this guideline to that patient. Uh, other thing is, uh, uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, the studies are also limited by the self-fulfilling prophecy of poor outcome. And because of this, there is still a significant amount of unavoidable uncertainty in prognosis for many of these patients. Now, the first rule of prognostication, I would say, is that make all efforts to eliminate any confounders, the most common being use of medications in the ICU setting. Uh, when you are assessing for that, make sure you are familiar with the half-life of various drugs that are used in the ICU setting, including sedation, pain medication, uh, paralytics, and also consider patients' renal and liver function. 
because a lot of these drugs are eliminated through these organs. And especially uh, after cardiac arrest, which is not uncommon, that patient will also have an existing uh, liver injury or renal failure because of the prolonged uh, resuscitation that was required. And the second rule is consider time your best friend. There is never a situation where you should be held accountable to provide prognosis then and then. You should always feel comfortable asking for more time to allow you to be more familiar with the patient's circumstances and also to see what is the natural progression or natural history of this particular patient's clinical course. So the current recommendation is to defer prognosis 72 hours after return of spontaneous circulation in patients who were not treated with targeted temperature management. If the TTM was used, then the recommendation is to further wait till additional 72 hours from the return to normal temperature or rewarming. And the reason is uh, this curve. So basically it shows how many patients come back to the awakening state after uh, entering into the coma because of cardiac arrest. And as you can see, majority of patients who do wake up, they usually wake up from coma following cardiac arrest within the 72 hours. Uh, and that's why like uh, waiting for 72 hours will help you by rendering uh, neuroprognostication unnecessary for a large majority of patients who are eventually going to wake up. And uh, in relation to TTM, so uh, the reason to provide additional waiting period for patients who were treated with TTM is this data showing that patients who were uh, brought to a lower temperature, uh, they took even a longer time uh, to come back to awakening state. Uh, currently, we don't use the temperature as low as they were used in the past, uh, particularly in this study. Uh, current, like most common clinical practice right now at Duke is to do temp targeted temperature management to 36 degree. But I think it is still applicable uh, because we lack data specifically from that uh, temperature uh, management. So uh, that is why recommendation is still to wait for additional 72 hours from uh, rewarming. There are four main classes or tools of predictors that you have available. First is a, and most essential is your clinical exam, which compromises of brainstem reflexes and motor exam. The second tool you have is the neurophysiology using EEG or SSCP. The third is the neuroimaging data based on either the CT or the MRI. And then there are biomarkers also that you can consider in a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, when we talk about these predictors, I would basically divide them into predictors that are most like reliable, moderately reliable, and predictors that should not be considered reliable in its own self. So the reliable predictors I would define as the predictors that are clear definition and actionable threshold available for the physician. Uh, and these predictors have a low false positive rate. So the false positive rate is the ratio that will tell you proportion of patients with a good outcome in whom the predictor for poor outcome was observed. So essentially you want the lower FPR or the lower false positive ratio for your predictor to be a better marker of poor prognosis. Uh, in an appropriate clinical context and in the absence of any confounder, this reliable predictors does can indicate that a poor outcome is very likely. There are basically two reliable predictors of poor functional outcome after cardiac arrest in a comatose patient. The first one is a clinical marker, absence of pupillary light response more than 72 hours from ROSC or rewarming. And the second one is an SSCP marker with an absence of N20, uh, greater than 48 hours from ROSC or rewarming. So the pupillary light response is actually the most studied and has the best quality data available. It has the lowest ratio of like fa lowest false positive rate uh, of less than 3%. Uh, 
and the confidence interval if you look at multiple studies uh, that were done is very narrow uh, making it most reliable the important thing when you are using it in your clinical practice is to make sure that you have verified that patients was not given any mydriatic eye drops which will falsely dilate the pupil this can happen in patients showing up unconscious or unresponsive or the other common thing in the icu being use of nebulizers uh, for bronchodilation and the third thing uh, to make sure that patient didn't have an eye surgery that would prevent light reflux uh, the other thing uh, also recommended nowadays is a use of quantitative pupillometry so uh, most of our residents uh, who have rotated through the neuro icu do feel very comfortable with this device essentially it removes the subjectivity behind the pupillary light reflex assessment and uh, this is a really good article showing that the use of quantitative pupillometry increase the specificity of uh, this index for poor pre out predictor of poor outcome from 96% to 100% and it also led to significant improvement in the sensitivity of uh, pupillary light response for poor prognosis uh, the other uh, reliable predictor is the absence of n20 waves uh, during an ssp after stimulation of median nerve so this is an example of a normal ssp how it would look like basically you are stimulating a median nerve and you are recording from the opposite side of the cortex uh, again this is a marker or predictor with a very low false positive rate uh, less than 3% similar to the pupillary light response uh, the benefit of using the ssp is also that lot of ssp data was studied at less than 48 hour mark uh, sorry at 48 hour mark so it it is a little bit it is an it is available little bit earlier the other thing is the ssp data is not confounded by use of sedation or the neuromuscular blockage the only caveat is in the icu setting you can have sometimes significant electrical interference and this background uh, electrical noise can make uh, ssp a little more difficult to interpret and the second thing especially when patient is showing unresponsive and you don't know exactly the circumstances you want to make sure that the conduction pathways at least patent from the stimulation of median nerve to the orbs point which is uh, next to the clavicle and the cervical spine which is like at the c5 c6 level which establishes that the conduction pathway is in uh, uh, available and if the n20 is absent that means it's the cortical lack of response so the next set of uh, predictors are uh, what i would label as moderate reliable these predictors also have a clear definition and actionable thresholds uh, there is a low rate of error in prediction of poor outcomes so again the fpr is usually low for these predictors but the certainty in evidence base is poor for this uh, uh, variables mainly because they have not been validated across different studies uh, when you are relying your prognosis on moderately reliable predictor the ideal practice would be to use multiple of them in a correct clinical context in the absence of any confounding factor and in that situation presence of this moderately reliable predictor will indicate the poor outcome is likely so there are three uh, commonly studied uh, moderately reliable predictors one is the eeg certain waveforms on eeg indicates uh, poor prognosis and then the other two are the imaging based including use of ct and the mri so when you are using eeg uh, again for prediction it is important that you make sure patient's uh, picture is not confounded by sedation hypothermia or metabolic derangements which can generate uh, poor looking eeg patterns uh, and when interpreting the eeg uh, persistence of a malignant pattern over time carries much more significance than just a single value identified using like different algorithms uh, the fpr ratio of 
uh, EEG is less than 5%, but there are studies also that showed that it can be false, elevated up to like 40, uh, up to 40%. These are uh, some of the example of EEG patterns that are considered to be highly malignant and indicator of poor out, uh, outcome. So on the upper panel, you have a suppression background with uh, discharge, periodic discharges or without periodic discharges. While in the bottom panel, you have burst suppression, again, without discharges or with discharges. And uh, this is uh, the commonly cited study for the use of standardized EEG uh, helping uh, prediction of, of prognosis after cardiac arrest. Again, uh, standardization of EEG uh, results led to specificity of up to 100% with this type of malignant patterns. The another tool that is currently studied and being developed is an automated EEG interpretation. Uh, one common algorithm that is being used is called continuous amplitude integrated EEG. So uh, this is an example of how it looks like. Basically, it is like studying the amplitude of electrical discharges in the cortical area. And then based on that, they would label whether it is a normal, continuously normal voltage amplitude or it is abnormal, which can be of different patterns. And uh, this is the study that identified its role as a prognosticator marker. Uh, when patients were studied using this, lack of development of continuous normal voltage uh, within 36 hours after ROS had 100% specificity to predict a poor outcome. So uh, this is a tool uh, that is uh, available uh, in, at certain places and uh, currently studied uh, for uh, multi-institutional uh, research. There are other EEG patterns of note which are not common, but you can come across them. One of them is like absence of EEG reactivity. Uh, this also has a good predictivity, but uh, the issue is like the interpretation is subjective. Uh, so that's why like it is not considered to be a highly reliable predictor. And the other variants of EEG patterns, including generalized alpha and theta coma, are considered to be a poor markers of pro markers of poor prognosis, uh, but uh, the frequency of uh, observing such EEG uh, waveforms is very low. Uh, one thing I would remind uh, is when we are most of these patients with cardiac arrest uh, in a comatose state do end up being on EEG, and oftentimes EEG will show number of different type of rhythmic and periodic discharges. And often I think uh, we get concerned enough that we start chasing or treating it. Uh, this was a recent study published few years ago in NEJM, and it showed that in a randomized control trial setting, when you treat this rhythmic or periodic EEG discharges, it doesn't improve the clinical or neurological outcomes. So uh, that's uh, important uh, things to remember when you're uh, assessing these patients. Right, so treatment of myoclonus sometimes is pursued to probably provide more comfort to the patient or the surrogate decision makers. It's true. Uh, the other moderated reliable predictors are MRI and the CT. Uh, the recommendation is to pursue an MRI brain within two to seven days uh, after the ROSC. Uh, and what you are looking for is a diffuse elevation of uh, DWI hyperintensity. Uh, the thing to remember is that this should be bilateral. It should cover both anterior and posterior circulation, and it should also cover both cortical and deep gray matter. Uh, there are things that would make an MRI look like this, including generalized seizure discharges. So you should make sure with an EEG that patient is not actually seizing. The other thing that can be observed sometime in this patient is also hyperammonemic encephalopathy. Uh, so that's also something that you may want to rule out using other markers. Uh, this is a, uh, a study by Dr. Harsh from uh, UCSF that showed that using a quantitative MRI where you are measuring the volume of ADC lesion 
and if the ADC lesion volume is greater than 10% of the brain tissue, uh, it was a highly predictive of poor outcome with a very high specificity and a positive predictive value. Uh, and then going to the CT scan, uh, CT scan is also a moderately reliable predictor of a poor outcome. Uh, what ends up often happening is patients tend to get CT scan too early, uh, mainly because people are looking for a neurological cause of cardiac arrest, such as like subarachnoid hemorrhage or something else. And if the CT scan is done too early, then it's probably not going to show you any hypoxemic damage. But if it is done beyond the first 24 hour or 48 hours, then presence of a diffuse loss of gray white differentiation is a very useful marker of poor prognosis. Uh, when you are assessing for that, couple of things you want to consider is making sure that you are not dealing with a lot of significant beam hardening artifact from the bone and also metal artifact from the EEG leads. Uh, most of the time, these patients will be on the EEG and having an EEG lead causing a metal artifact will make it very difficult for you to confidently say whether the patient indeed has a loss of gray white differentiation in the cortical area or not. Uh, I would move on to some of the other clinical variables that are helpful, but in itself, they should not be considered as a reliable predictors of poor functional outcome. So the first one is the loss of corneal reflex. Uh, the reason it is not a reliable indicator in itself is the corneal reflex can be uh, affected by sedation and muscle relaxation for some time, prolonged time. And often our method to assess that is not always reliable. So a uh, lo lot of our residents who have rotated through the neuro ICU and work with uh, our APP colleague, Bob Blessing, gets teaching about how to make sure you're checking the corneal reflex correctly. And I think it is very important. And that's why like he always reiterate that on the round. It, it is important to make sure that you are actually touching the limbus of the cornea. And if that does not give you a response, you should carefully move towards the center. Oftentimes clinicians end up checking just the conjunctiva and that will probably give you a, a false absence of a corneal reflex. Uh, the other one similarly is a best motor response. Uh, Again, the reason it is not as good reliable indicator is the variable intensity that people apply stimulus with. So sometimes like you will hear that, oh, patient had an extension, some next person goes and they say like, patient didn't respond. But a lot of them that variability in observation is because of the variability of the stimulus in, uh, applied. And other things also would affect uh, this outcome, including uh, if patient had any residual neuromuscular blockade, if patient had a neuropathy, severe polyneuropathy from ICU illness, encephalopathy that was causing uh, like uh, abnormal motor responses. And that's why the false positive rate is higher for this up to 15%. Uh, next one in this category is myoclonus. So uh, historically myoclonus was considered to be like a poor prognosticator marker. Uh, the difficulty is myoclonus might not be the same thing for different clinician, especially people who are not uh, experienced in seeing myoclonus, uh, not from a neurology background, may not identify abnormal movement correctly. And that is why it in itself is not a useful marker, but using a concurrent EEG monitoring can help us identify malignant patterns associated with uh, poor outcome when you have a post-anoxic myoclonus. So uh, another uh, quick pop quiz. I have a patient who is having a post-anoxic myoclonus. And uh, so supposedly there are two different patients. They are both having post-anoxic myoclonus. And one has an EEG pattern on the left and the other one has an EEG pattern of the right. Which one we think is going to have a higher likelihood of a favorable outcome, uh, A or B? Any takers? Yes. <laughs> so what matters is the background. Uh, so when you have an, a post-anoxic myoclonus patient, but EEG is showing continuous background, 
those patients tend to have a much higher a chance of a favorable outcome, even if they are showing you like spike wave discharges, which are lockstep with myoclonic jerk. Compared to that, if you have a post anoxic myoclonus patient uh, with a background of burst suppression, uh, with intermittent high amplitude polyspikes that are in lock stack, uh, step with myoclonic jerk, that patient will have a poorer outcome. Uh, uh, there are also other form of post anoxic myoclonus, which actually tend to be seen in patients with a better neurological outcome. So one common thing that I think everybody probably is aware about is the Lance Adam syndrome which tends to be a delayed post anoxic myoclonus in patients, survivors of cardiac arrest. Uh, and the last one I will put in this category is uh, the biomarker that is widely used called neuron specific knowledge. Uh, the reason it is not as reliable is there is a lot of variability in how it is measured across different laboratories. Uh, most often this is a send out lab, so it is also not available in a timely manner. Uh, it is a biomarker with its own kinetics. So the label of this uh, specific protein is going to vary with the time course of patient's injury. And the studies that have been done using this biomarker, each of them had a, done at a different point, end point or dif a different point in time with a different threshold. So as a result, we don't have like a good meta-analysis that we can conduct to identify a valid threshold across multiple different studies. There are other factors which are important uh, for patient's prognosis. Uh, and this is true for any disease that you would think about, uh, such as age. But again, uh, I would uh, advise that uh, age alone should not drive you to provide a prognosis as a poor versus good, uh, because each elderly patient is going to be different than the other patient that might be of the same age group. And same thing can be said for a young patient. The initial cardiac rhythm, whether it is a shockable or a non-shockable rhythm, again, it is an important factor, uh, but it, we should not be using it in isolation because often the recognition of cardiac rhythm is going to be problematic in this type of situation. Uh, and the same thing can be said about time of to return of, of spontaneous time to return of uh, return of spontaneous circulation, which is basically because uh, the quality of CPR also matters highly in how these patients do. So it's not only about how long the time it took them to get our ROSC back, but it's also about the quality of uh, uh, CPR they have received during that. These are variables that are like part of. Uh, uh, other predictive model that use multiple different variables, but they are not uh, useful in its isolation. So these are the prediction model that are commonly used. Uh, one of them is called the out of hospital cardiac arrest model. And the other one is a cardiac arrest hospital prognosis model. Uh, both of them were developed by the cardiologists. So they have parameters like how long uh, what was the time interval for no flow state, uh, how long patient was in a low flow state. Uh, the downside of these models are like, even for the cardiologists, it's like difficult to say how much uh, time duration patients spend in these states. Uh, you should always put the whole clinical context uh, available to you. Uh, so this will include what was the patient's prior functional baseline. Did the patient have any pre-existing illness limiting life expectancy, such as like malignancy, or they have like multiple organ failure that is escalating? Uh, and this type of complete clinical scenario will be useful in providing prognosis and education to the patient's family members. Uh, there are also uh, clinical variables that you can use as a predictors for good clinical out, good neurological outcomes. So this will include motor response, which is better than withdrawal, uh, presence of reactivity in the EEG recording within the first 24 hour, uh, or a continuous EEG like uh, background within the 12 hours from ROSC. 
uh, when the SSCP amplitude is higher than four microvolt, uh, that is also considered to be a good marker of cortical, preserved cortical function. And then absence of any DWI abnormalities on MRI within first week of ROSC. So this all can uh, tell you that patient may not have as severe anoxic brain injury uh, as may, it may appear at the time of presentation. The unfortunate thing when providing prognosis is that majority of time we are going to end up in a situation where you don't have reliable predictors available to guide you. Uh, the important thing in this type of situation is providing accurate counseling about what uncertainty you are dealing with uh, when commenting on neurological recovery. Also, uh, use your best judgment to guide the family about what timeline they should expect for neurological recovery. Because often, uh, if it is a matter of months or longer than that, then family may consider other factors, uh, including patient's own expressed wishes prior to this event. And if possible, taking more time is always helpful to identify the clinical trajectory. Uh, this is a really good uh, algorithm uh, that I would encourage all of you to take a look uh, when you are providing consultations uh, for these patients. Uh, basically, it summarizes all the steps that we walk through here. Uh, and this is available in the Neurocritical Care Society guideline for uh, prognosis after cardiac arrest. There are, uh, this is a very active area of research, especially nowadays with the use of large data set, uh, availability of electronic uh, uh, medical records. Uh, this is an area where a number of researchers are involved using technologies like machine learning or AI to come up with better prognosticator uh, and better models of prognosis. Uh, there is also a significant research going on in developing further biomarkers to provide uh, better guidance to us. This would be my take home points from this talk. Remember, like taking more time is always going to put you in a better spot. Exclude the confounders as much as possible. Maintain an honest communication with patient surrogate decision makers and try to identify what were patients previously expressed or stated wishes. Be humble and aware about the limitation of our own ability to provide prognosis in this condition. Uh, last but not the least, uh, I, would, I wanted to put uh, a plug in about uh, this initiative from the Neurocritical Care Society. Uh, this is called Curing Coma. Uh, so these are the patients that neurointensivists tend to uh, provide care in a, lo a lot of different settings. And uh, there is an active uh, program going on to support more research in this area. And uh, I wanted to thanks to all the amazing people that I get to work with. Uh, these are some of the pictures of our neuro ICU team. As you see, like we do work hard, but we also try to play hard. Uh, and I really enjoy being part of this amazing team. Uh, thank you. I do want to see, uh, there is a, one of our fellow who wanted to put a brief plug in about his own research that he's doing in this area. So let me see. Oh, hey, Gabe, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm here. I don't know if I can share my screen so I can show people what we're doing. Uh, you can now. You're a co-host now, Gabe. Okay. okay. All right. So, I guess, good morning, everyone. I'm one of the Neuro ICU fellows. Dr. Shah asked me to just talk one minute about this uh, study that we've been running pretty much a year now. Um, so what we are testing is a vestibular stimulator, and I wanted to show this. This is like an abstract that we presented, and there's a photo here. So the stimulator is uh, like earbuds, like earphones, that instead of delivering music, they deliver a, a heat waves that they oscillate between one ear and the other, and they go from 17 degrees to 42 degrees. Um, so the idea is that these heat waves will stimulate the vestibular nuclei, and then these will relay in the thalamus, which eventually will um, uh, stimulate uh, plasticity in the in the in the frontal brain. Um, so this should work, or our hypothesis that uh, it should work for patients that are in a minimally conscious state, potentially, or 
probably patients that are comatose or uh, unresponsive on, on, on uh, wakefulness, uh, there's not a lot of like synapses that you can potentiate. But in those that they have a minimally conscious state, uh, our idea is that we start this early on uh, and we deliver the stimulation for 15 days, it will allow them to emerge from the minimally conscious states faster. Um, so the trial is very intensive in the sense that we see them one day and we get like a clinical information. We also get EEG and TCDs the first day. And then we deliver the stimulation for 14 days. And in the end, we repeat the EEG and we repeat the TCDs and some of the coma recovery scales and all other scales that where we measure the clinical progress. Um, we, we already enrolled one patient. Um, turned out that the stimulator might have uh, caused some uh, bradycardia. So that was uh, interesting because it, it did prove that the stimulator was working on the brainstem, uh, but perhaps we are not expecting uh, this. So we'll see what happens as we enroll uh, more people. But I think that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'd invite you to come down and, and ask your questions to Shri. And I, I wanna thank Shri and Gabrielle for a great job. I, I, nobody lets me be the inpatient attending anymore, but I, I did learn a couple things in my day. I just want to mention the first is that when you're talking to a family about poor prognosis or poor outcome, they are thinking about coma and that they're not going to wake up. So you have to tell them that's not what you're saying, because if they kind of wake up into some kind of vegetative state, they're going to think you were wrong and they're going to lose kind of confidence. So make sure you make that distinction to them. You're talking about prognosis, not necessarily uh, uh, waking up, uh, you know, or, or becoming even alert, but just not able to function very well. And I, I always thought, and then the other thing, it's surprising how patients misinterpret decision making and that they don't quite understand that you're not asking them to pull the plug or make a decision. You're asking them to say, what would the patient want? Were, were they able to make the decision? And that also, you know, saying that really clearly takes a lot of the burden off the poor person who is, is making this decision. And so uh, everyone can go off, but I, I just wanna ask one thing. A couple of years ago, there was this study that showed if you whispered into a comatose patient's ear, imagine you're playing tennis, the fMRI would show the right. tennis area going off. How, has that changed? Do, do people mention that or does it matter? Is that irrelevant? So I think it's irrelevant. Uh, right. So uh, <laughs> I think both answers are correct. Uh, that is a still an ongoing area of research. And there are a number of centers, especially in Germany, that are using this kind of fMRI to predict a uh, conscious state in a patient who appears otherwise in coma. Uh, the hesitation that a lot of people have about this work is that it doesn't materially differentiate patient's outcome. A uh, lot of these patients are still complete, like all of these patients are still completely bed bound and dependent for all of their care. So uh, that is why I think there is not a whole lot of enthusiasm about identifying this underlying conscious state if it is not going to give a good quality of life uh, back to the patient. All right, well, uh, again, thank you. Great. Thank, thanks for Christine for bringing it in in five minutes in such a great case. Everyone remember to get your serum PCRs for ticks and other horrible things. <laughs> By the way, the, the, the tick, the uh, uh, alpha gal thing discovered at the University of Virginia, by the way, uh, where many of our faculty have been. So come down and ask for your question. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Feng, I'll call you back. Okay. I was, I have a question, but I can talk okay, to go you. Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, we're all extra time. Okay. Well, um, sure. I think uh, I, one of the questions I have, you know, why you think you know light reflux and a corneal reflux? To me, the from an anatomical point of view. Um, well, they, yeah, they right. So that, why one of them is a, yeah, yeah, more I, reliable than the other? From anatomical point of view, I don't get it. I would hope you can give some uh, give a little right, uh, right. So I, I think the reason like one of them is more reliable than the other. So like the pupillary response is more reliable than the corneal response 
is that the corneal response tends to get more confounded by the factors that are present in these patients.